more young female college students began vanishing. 19-year-old Donna Mason was last seen heading to a concert. She never got there. 18-year-old Susan Rancourt disappeared as she walked across Ellensburg, Washington State College campus at night. 22-year-old Roberta Parks vanished from Oregon State University. 22-year-old Brenda Ball disappeared as she left the Flame Tavern in a district of Seattle. And 18-year-old George Ann Hawkins, who was only days away from completing her first year of studies, mysteriously vanished as she walked between sorority houses after visiting fellow students. All she had to do was come down four houses between that and, and her house. She never got down. Each victim had center parted long dark hair. Each was slim, attractive and bright. Each resembled Bundy's dream girl. Generally, there is a lot of similarity among victims of serial killers. Serial killers in general have a, a type. It was almost as if Bundy was trying to gain revenge over this particular woman, uh, a particular class, a particular type of woman. It was almost as if he was on a mission. Six young women had simply disappeared, leaving behind only a question. How had they been abducted with seemingly no struggle, no clues, and no witnesses? As Bundy's reign of terror continued, the chilling answer would be revealed. Nineteen seventy four. In and around Washington State, six bright, attractive young women had been abducted by serial killer Ted Bundy. The girls had simply disappeared, leaving law enforcement confused and without a clear suspect. How was Bundy kidnapping his victims unnoticed and without a struggle? He knew he had to create access to a suitable victim. But how would he go about being able to convince this woman to come with him in the car, to walk with him some way away from where she might be socializing with her friends? The mystery was about to be revealed. Lake Sammamish State Park was a popular hangout for Seattle's young men and women. On July the 14th, 1974, teenager Dawn Sanders was one of many young girls heading to the lake. Well, it was a nice, sunny, warm Sunday afternoon. We always like to go down to the park as much as possible. And my girlfriend and I, typical, you know, we were 14, 15 years old, headed down to the park to see what, who was there and who, what kind of trouble we could get into, basically. That Sunday in July, it was really hot, and the state park was always crowded on hot weekends. They would line up in their cars trying to get one of the few parking spots at the state park, and it's a very large park. It's one of the busiest in the state. A friend of ours was approached by a young man in a cast. He asked her to help him get something off the roof of his car. The girl was one of several to be approached by a man with what looked like a broken arm. She was 17, beautiful, shoulder-length brown hair, brown eyes. She didn't go with him anywhere, it didn't go any further than that. It's likely the man was Bundy, wearing a fake plaster cast. Witnesses saw the same approach made to an attractive, lone 23-year-old. Janice was sitting on a towel by herself and a good-looking man came up to her and asked her if she would help 
get his canoe off his car. And he said, it's just up in the parking lot. She said, okay, and she went with him. That's the last time she was seen. The nature of Janice Ott's disappearance would provide an insight into how Bundy had abducted at least seven young women without so far drawing attention to himself. What Bundy did seemed to me to be incredibly clever. He would wear casts on his arm. He'd pretend to be injured in some way and ask for help. Now, of course, what this is doing is simply creating access. Once he has that access, he uses the opportunity that that access gives him to facilitate the kill. But the extraordinary events of the hot July day would not end with the disappearance of Janice Ott. Only hours later, as 40,000 people reveled in the sunshine, Bundy was back and roaming freely amongst them. A little later in the afternoon, Denise Nasland was there with her boyfriend and another couple and she had to go to the restroom and it's kind of a concrete um, little box sitting off by itself. She went, never came back. Bundy had abducted two young women from the same busy location on the same day in broad daylight. The psychological gain that he got from the first murder wasn't enough to sustain him. He needed more. Serial killing starts as a consequence of a fantasy. The fantasy becomes refined over time. So one ultimately wasn't enough. The fantasy demanded that two were necessary. Using helicopters and dogs, the police began a massive search of some 400 acres around Lake Sammamish Park. Not a trace was found. The girls had simply disappeared. I recall her boyfriend who'd been at the park with her that day. I remember him being there while during the search and leaning on his car and, and just crying, just sobbing that it was you know, fearing the worst. But Bundy's audacity had betrayed him. The park was so busy that day that it was easy for them to put together some profiles that quickly identified this person that they identified as Ted. People at the park heard him introduce himself to, to Janice Ott and saw her leave with him. Within that week, they had a composite sketch of uh, uh, the man that they believed uh, who turned out to be Ted Bundy. When I look back on that day now, I don't remember it as, as innocent as it was. Despite having a name and description for the suspect, no one who knew him would connect the charismatic young Ted Bundy with the man who'd now abducted at least eight women. My friend and myself commented when, when it came up that summer that, uh, that there was a clue of somebody by the name of Ted that had a Volkswagen. And we commented and, and joked that, you know, maybe it's Ted because he's never here. But of course, that, that was really something we didn't consider because of his characteristics, you, you would never imagine that he would be involved in something like that. If serial killers came with horns on their heads, we could avoid them. Unfortunately, serial killers are often very charming, very seducing. So we shouldn't imagine somehow serial killers are Hollywood devils, because actually it's the banality of evil that we're dealing with in serial killers. By mid-September 1974, Bundy was on the move. He headed to Salt Lake City 